Have you ever been reading a celebrity pastor's blog posts or listening to a famous Bible teacher and something jumps out to you and you're just like, how am I the only person seeing this thing? Why isn't anyone talking about it? Well, you're not alone. Welcome to Underdog Theology. This podcast is about looking at what's happening in evangelicalism. I'm talking tweets, I'm talking books, blogs, videos, all of it, and judging it according to scripture. Whether that's reacting to celebrity pastors, teasing about the latest ridiculous battle in the culture war, or just having a little bit of fun together, this show is for all the folks who feel like they're on the outside looking in, who feel like they don't have a voice, who feel like they're an underdog. Welcome to Underdog Theology. What's up, everybody? Hope your Monday is going super great. Boy, do I love having this microphone on a stand and being able to pick it up. For anyone who listens to the podcast, which I haven't uploaded in like a month, a month's worth of episodes, probably more than that at this point, uh, you wouldn't be able to see that I'm holding my microphone. you got to hop onto YouTube's for, for that kind of stuff, for the good stuff, and also to get actual episodes. I pretty much abandoned the podcast. Um, I'll get back to it, maybe, eventually, probably not. What's going on, everybody? I hope your Monday's going great. Uh, we've got some stuff to talk about. Oh, Marky Mark is back at it. Except for, he's got a different spin on things. It's a little interesting. Um... Not just because of what he says, but why he's saying it. Uh, A little bit of uh, some of the things that he has said about society in general. And then he makes a video like this. It's it's interesting. We're going to get into the weeds about it. We're going to dive into it. He released his uh, How Dare You sermon again. And uh, that in itself is kind of like newsworthy. But uh, he had like an eight minute video that he gave the reasonings and why everyone who has ever been like, I don't like this sermon should be ashamed of themselves. So we're going to talk about that. Uh, That's what we got going on in the show. We got a new segment, new segment uh, featuring a popular DJ. Uh, I knew a DJ in high school. His name was DJ Skittles. If you watch DJ Skittles. What's up, man? How's it going, sheep? (laughs) Oh, that's an old school thing. He doesn't watch. I don't know. Maybe he does. Uh, Hey, you know what? We've got lots of people who do watch, and they are hopping into the chat, and the chat is empty (laughs) because I moved it. Uh, I got a little bit of a cough today, so we'll see. We'll see how that goes. Ah, dagnabbit. Uh, I'm going to have to pull you guys up one by one we got lumberton church who is saying i hit the like button in faith and you know what i appreciate it i appreciate it uh we've got rj who's saying she's not late and i guess that's a normal like as uh, she's usually late that's okay guys you know i get people who send me messages even like sorry i missed the show it's like you don't you don't have to be sorry about it. It's okay. It lives on YouTube. You could come in whenever you want. Whenever you got time. Guys, I don't It's not like I'm just sitting here being like you know who isn't here. You know, I'm not one of those pastors that's like taking a t- attendance every Sunday and it's like this deacon hasn't been here and uh he's missed 3 out of the last like 6 months worth of Sundays. So, I don't know if he could be a deacon anymore. That's not what we're doing. I'm not taking attendance. If you're here, awesome. If you're not, you probably got busier stuff to do. Aaron's got busy stuff, but he's still here because he makes it a priority. Oh, hypocritical. I <laughs> just went back on everything. Just said. Uh, let's see. Mike is also here. I get to listen, but I get, don't get to chat because I have to drive. Well, we know that you're driving and we could all pretty much just assume. Let's take a couple times today. And just assume what Mike is. Does anyone in the chat want to like be like a pseudo account for Mike today and be his voice? And we will just ascribe everything that person says to Mike. <laughs> and I'm, I'm pretty sure nothing could possibly go wrong with that. Uh, the Claymore is here and says hello. 
uh, and uh, there was some discussion about preemptive and what that means. I don't know if it was the right word for me to say. I just said hit the like button because here's something that crazy that happened last week. We had 140 people watching live. Now, like once a stream is over, usually we get about 2000 views right now. And that's that's a good video. Uh, but live, we usually get around 60 to 80 right now, which is awesome. But last week was crazy. And uh, 190 some odd likes on a video. It didn't go like crazy viral, but I really appreciate that. And I would love it if we get 100. That's like my new goal with each video is to entertain you, give you at least some insights for you to think about, and then um, get 100 likes. That's what I want. I don't care about the views anymore. I just want the likes. <laughs> so if you could hit the like button, I would appreciate it. Johnny says, Baptist drinking game with a skull cup. Oh, Dean, you played a hard game. I'm just saying. Like, I've had this cup forever. If I drink it like this, you'll never know. It's it's like a true IFB cup. It's like, oh, it looks so pretty on one side. And then like behind the scenes, you know, that's where that's where it's like, oh, no, what is that person up to? You know, you got, oh, all the all the fundies are like, what what's on the other side of that cup of his heart? <laughs> I don't know. It's been a weird day. Um, let's see. Do you like car? Uh, do your Carhartt choices reflect your mood like Sheldon's on the Big Bang Theory? Uh, I will never, ever, ever watch an episode of the Big Bang Theory, at least uh, if I have any willpower or any decision making uh, ability in that situation. Can't stand it. I'm a big nerd. Look around. Look around the set, guys. I'm a big nerd. Uh, but nope. Nope. Uh, some things are just too much for me. So, um, I don't know about that. It doesn't reflect my mood. I'm not sad. I'm, I'm, a, I'm pretty happy today, uh, but I'm wearing blue. So that must mean I'm sad deep down, maybe on the other cup side of my heart. <laughs> uh, how dare you, uh, great sermon, great sermon. Is that what you're saying? Uh oh, <laughs> we're going to have some disagreements. <laughs> I'm going to get the claymore. Uh, I, uh, Carol says, I like watching the show. It's fun. I appreciate that you like watching the show. Oh, this, uh, I'll, like as I'm talking about likes and stuff and, uh, we'll get into like, we got the penalty box today and there's some stuff about the penalty box and me and how I host the show and, uh, how I beat around the bush forever and, you know, just hold the content hostage. Uh, <laughs> but that's what I do. Okay, it's what I do. Uh, because I like chatting with you guys. I just like having a good time. I want my streams to be hangout spots for people. And uh, part of that is also making sure that when we are in the chat, we are being a kind, compassionate community. The, the uh, community has grown. Uh, last week, we, we I forgot to mention, but 6,000 subscribers. That's great. That's awesome. Uh, and 140 people watching live. And that's really cool too. So we're getting some new people in and I just want to make sure uh, that you are reading the, the guidelines and stuff that I set out on like the chats in the comment sections and just making sure like that we're being respectful, that we're acting in a way that God would like. All right. Uh, and not calling anybody names. And uh, you know, if you've got a lot of negativity towards someone, you know, just be respectful. You could, you could say, you know, like I disagree like this, the, the chat is, is there. I want to point at it, but I messed up and put it on the other side of my screen. You know what? Maybe I could fix that. Can I fix it? Probably not. Uh, let's no, no, I don't want to just take that comment. Let's take the whole chat, the whole chat. And we're going to go over here. And now when I put the chat, Oh snap, it kind of works. <laughs> <laughs> Got to move it a little bit. Uh, does that work? Does that work? Is that good enough? I don't know. Probably not. Let's go all the way. We have to go all the way over here. Why? Why all that way? I don't want it to be that far. You know what? We're going to take it. We're going to put it over here. Not over there. <sighs> guys, I don't know why you guys watch this stuff. <laughs> I, I can't stop. I can't stop myself. It's a problem. Um, that's going to be good enough, I guess. Uh, and 
<laughs> totally derailed everything I was saying. But just make sure that, you know, when you're when you're in here, that you're being respectful to other people and even the people that we're talking about. OK, uh, I've seen some things. So I'll just say that I've seen some things over the last couple of weeks and it bothers me. It bothers me because I really try to make sure that we're being kind and compassionate about what we say. We can still have fun. We can still tease, guys. We can still tease and have a little bit of fun. But, uh, you know, just don't be calling anybody any names. Uh, and let's see. We got Heidi here. All my kids are on spring break. They're on spring break. <laughs> we would have... <laughs> We would have invited you, but we forgot. Uh, that's that's a Homestar Runner reference. Anybody remember that? Oh, man. The millennial days. Uh, let's see. Sam is here. What's up, Sam? We got Whitney Creamer. And for a Driscoll episode to boot, finally able to make it live. What? We got to celebrate that. We got to celebrate. I like it. I like that you're all here. All right, all right, all right. Uh, and let's see. Kip is here. We got Jer is here. More Marky Mark. Can't wait to hear this one. Uh, John Miller is here. We've got all the all the people's. Oh, Mike is saying, since someone is ghostwriting my comments, can you ghostwrite my sermon too? That's trendy these days. You got to pay for that. There's a service that I offer. It is $7.99 a month. And if you do that, I will send you a blank piece of paper. <laughs> That's what I'll do and say, and with another piece of paper that says, do it yourself. <laughs> but, uh, yeah, <laughs> seems to be a very popular thing. Uh, let's see. Uh, Got to keep the riffraff in check, says Sam. I'm just saying. Uh, Heidi says, I know I'm in a wild mood today. Watch our chat. Watch out, chat. It's a good day to get a dad talk from Dean about being kind. LOL. I'm just saying. I'm sorry to bust out like the. Uh, authority voice but i have to sometimes because some sometimes people just need to be reminded and it doesn't mean that you like you're a bad person or anything it just means like hey you know be nice be nice and we got some love for homestar runner all right so it was a good thing that i took three minutes to move the chat all right let's get to it all the people that are like i have been waiting uh not not much longer all right but i will say 45 people watching live we got 25 likes. We got one dislike. So either we need to bump up those dislikes or people need to hit the like button. All right, here we go. Let's talk about Marky Mark. Uh, if you are unfamiliar with Mark Driscoll, I don't know how you found this channel, to be honest. But you did. You did. And you're unfamiliar. He was the pastor of Mars Hill up in Seattle for years. He started that church. It was a huge church. Uh, lots of campuses, I think like 15 campuses all together. I might be a little bit off on the numbers. Um, then he had this really public falling out where he was being accused of being a bully and a tyrant and, um, you know, basically being angry and that that was disqualifying. They, they said like, basically he was being a brawler is what scripture defines it as. And so they asked for him to step down while they did an investigation and like this healing process, essentially church discipline. And, uh, he decided to go through with that. And he was uh, out there on a Sunday. I remember watching the video, uh, of him coming out and saying, you know, he was crying and he was like, we're going to go through this process. Well, uh, that didn't last too long because like next thing you know, he's on his way to Arizona. Uh, so he he left his church, did not go through church discipline, and then he went and planted uh, a church plant in Arizona called Trinity Church, which you are probably now, uh, if you don't remember like the Marshall stuff, maybe it's before your time, you just don't care about like internet stuff and you're not paying attention to who's pastoring what church and whatnot. Um, you probably know him now as the Trinity Church pastor uh, because he's gone all over the internet. We've talked about him a whole ton on this channel because his platform is growing. Uh, it just continues to grow. And it's Honestly, it's kind of sad that no one seems to be discussing it. Uh, of course, there was the podcast put out by Christianity Today, um, uh, the, the Rise and Fall of Mars Hill, and that was super popular, and people understood, okay, this is where you know he went wrong. There was a lot of um, <sighs> aggression toward women. Um yeah, uh, I think that's probably the word that I'll use the most because everyone's suing everybody now. Um, but uh, <laughs> like there's 
there was a lot. It was the over overly complementarian mindset, men being in charge, women are basically just, you know, you stay at home, you raise your family, you don't get to work outside the church unless, or uh, outside the family unless it's at a church, and even then, uh, probably not, or at least you don't get to make any decisions. It was very much like that world, uh, and then everything fell apart, and uh, we got the rise and fall of Marsville, but ever since then, uh, I thought that that was just like, okay, well, Mark Driscoll's done, right? Like how do you, I still, it's, it's kind of amazing, uh, that, that somehow, uh, like a, like a cockroach, he has survived. <laughs> like you, you just can't, you can't destroy this guy apparently because a whole podcast that a lot of people listen to most cr- like Christians who care about online media, they probably listen to at least a couple episodes of the rise and fall of Mars Hill. And still Mark Driscoll's platform is growing. Uh, on YouTube, he's over 300,000, uh, Twitter. He's all of a sudden a big deal when a couple years ago he wasn't, uh, like, I mean, I used to joke with my wife. I've said this before. I used to joke with my wife that I got more likes on my tweet than Mark Driscoll got on his. (laughs) And it's just, and I, like, I, I had 300 followers, I think at the time, I just thought it was really funny. That's the world that we lived in. (laughs) And, uh, that's not the case anymore. Uh, He gets tons of of attention online and his platform continues to grow despite this podcast being out. But ever since then, everyone's been like radio silent on the Mark Driscoll front, like the Gospel Coalition that platformed Mark Driscoll there. They haven't said anything since that the rise and fall of Mars Hill. And yet he continues to grow. And all these people that you would think should should be out there, you know, raising the red flags and being like, Hey, we let this happen last time and it didn't go well. So we're going to be, you know, a little bit more on the offense about this thing and tell you he should not be listened to. Just, it continues to happen. So, uh, we're going to continue to talk about Mark Driscoll and we're going to continue to point out errors and, uh, false narratives that he puts out. Uh, and he put out a big one. He put out a real big one this weekend with his video. Uh, Let me know in the chat if you ever listen to the sermon, uh, you know, that he's yelling, how dare you? I don't remember the text. I think Mark gets into it here in the video we're about to watch. Um, But he basically just got up and started screaming at the men in his church. And a lot of us thought like, okay, it's a pastor who's just really passionate about what he's talking about. And then the rise and fall of Mars Hill comes out and talks about like some of the details that were around this situation. And I thought it made it untenable for him to like put this back out there because he, it, it was all false. Like this, this rage that he had was, was a, a drama. <laughs> like he was going up and acting and acting like this way and doing it through multiple services And um, I don't know if Mark Driscoll actually listened to the rise and fall of Mars Hill. We know. Hey, Mark, um, if you're watching, because apparently you've left comments here. um, (laughs) So maybe you do watch this stuff and maybe you did watch or listen to the rise and fall of Mars Hill. Uh, But there are details that are there that I think uh, really falsify or at least uh, uh, show this narrative that he's giving to be false. So let's get into the video. All that beating around the bush. Here we go. Uh, let's let's take a look and listen to Mark explain why he preached that sermon. And I just want us to, you know, we'll we'll stop every once in a while and point out a few things. And yeah, we'll. It gets intense if you have little kids like Heidi or anyone else who has like little kids running around. Um, there are some things in here uh, that might be a little sensitive. Not anything explicit, but. You know, he gets he gets going into a few things. So just giving you that little warning. Uh, some years ago, I had a clip that kind of went viral before there was viral. They put it on the radio. Um, <laughs> I know. Stopping it already. Uh, viral has always been a thing. I, I hate when people say before viral was a thing. Uh, things have always gotten popular. <laughs> so it's not like popularity is like a new thing. Okay, moving on. It was from a men in marriage series in first and second Peter. And Aaron, think, you were right. Uh, it was like 15 years ago. Um, 
So I'll just be honest with you. This is just kind of off the cuff. Um, here was the story behind it. And for my critics and enemies. Um, this is off the cuff, right? I feel like that needs to be pointed out that he is claiming he's just sitting down. You know, he just has, oh yeah, he's got the 4K camera out and the lighting is perfect. And he just, he's just uh, got a microphone just set up and he's just going off the cuff. Come on. We, we all know how media works. This is, this as poor of quality as my show is, well, it's better than some, but as poor of quality, this is not off the cuff. Okay. Enemies that have used it, uh, shame on you, but here's the truth. Um, so I know <laughs> some of you guys are probably like, is, how long is this video going to take? It keeps on stopping. Um, to my enemies uh, in critics, uh, they've they've used this against me to their shame. Here's the truth. So he's saying that everyone else is lying. When you say here's here's the truth, you're saying that what was presented before was false. So you know you might not hear him say they're a bunch of liars, but the people who are listening to him, the people that might be swindled into following him, uh. They're, they're hearing, I should trust you because you're giving me the truth. Not everyone else like Mike Cosper, who, who did the rise and fall of Mars Hill or any of the other critics that are online, uh, because they're false. They're giving you lies. So I'm telling the truth. And by saying that the other people who have different narratives, that's all lies. So, uh, these are the things you got to stop and really think through some of the words that people use when they're getting into these kinds of situations. My uh, wife, Grace, who I met at uh, 17 on one of our first dates, uh, there was a guy stalking her and tried to run me over with a motorcycle. We, uh, we weren't dating, we were just friends. And, uh, and I got in the middle to protect her and, and uh, was really worried about her safety and uh, and then some years later, we were married and started ministry and had kids. And uh, Grace had given birth to our uh, our fifth child, uh, a beautiful baby boy who is now. I will say this. Uh, Mark Driscoll's family looks like they love him to death. Uh, so I know like we talk a lot about negativity. I want to point out positive things when I can. And I think that speaks a lot to how he is as a dad. Uh, so, you know, I don't know. Maybe there'll be... <laughs> like some some biographies written in the future that contradict that but his family always looks like they really really love him high school senior and we were sitting uh upstairs in uh our bedroom she was folding laundry and we were visiting and i asked her i said uh, let me just ask you some questions so i started asking questions about that previous relationship with that person who had stalked her and i had to literally get in the way to physically protect her um and she started telling me some specific details of some things that had happened to her before I met her that I had never known. And at this point, um, you know, we'd been married for, I don't even know. So our son would have been, uh, I mean, maybe close to 20 years at that time. I don't even know. Um, and, and as she started answering the question, she was busy folding the laundry. And I just started, uh, I was weeping uncontrollably because it dawned on me that um, my best friend who I, <clears throat> you know, I care the most about. She she was a sexual assault victim many times and repeatedly, and it just wrecked me. Um, I grew up in a dangerous neighborhood. Green River Killer, Ted Bundy, prostitutes. Uh, one of the gals that was murdered was my buddy's friend, and she was turning tricks. And uh, sometimes I would be driving to work on what's called Pacific Highway, and some of the gals that were out prostituting were gals from my high school. I mean, I knew these gals. and. Um, it was a horrible situation. A couple of strip clubs within walking distance in my house, uh, massage parlors, hourly rate. And so I just saw the evil that men did to women. And it. Um, okay. So let's, let's talk about, let's make sure that we're clear. Uh, I'm not going to call Mark Driscoll a liar about like his wife and anything that happened there. I don't know. I don't know his personal life. Um, uh, we'll say the timing sounds weird. Uh, I don't know if that's just, you know, recalling things, but he's talking about like 20 years and you're thinking about the time frame of when he preached that sermon. I don't know if everything adds up, um, but 
you know, if this happened to his wife, that's, that's awful. And I think many of us could relate to that. You know, we've talked a lot about abuse on this channel. Uh, I think many of us are sympathetic to that and understand like how devastating that is for uh, the person who has been abused, but also for the spouse or someone who loves that person or even cares about that person. Maybe not even like married or something like that, but you're just like a friend and it hurts. Uh, so I'm sure like those emotions are genuine. Like that seems genuine to me. Uh, now, like, I don't know why he goes on this tirade about, you know, like, <laughs> <laughs> like there's all there's bars, there's strip clubs, there's, you know, all this stuff. Uh, he's describing, I believe he's from federal way, Washington, uh, which I grew up in Everett. And, um, I'm just saying, if you think federal way is like a hard place to grow up, like you've never been to Everett <laughs> or at least casino road, <laughs> like that area. Um, but in, and then if you think growing up in Everett's hard, try growing up in Tacoma. <laughs> Like that's, that's, that's a place. Um, now uh, I might be wrong. I don't like, I'm just going off of what I remember, but what he's trying to do here is all right. Um, you know, his wife went through this, uh, when they were dating, I guess. And like the motorcycle story, I don't know. Like sometimes I just hear stuff like that. And I go like, did a guy just drive by fast? Like he tried to hit me with a motorcycle. Why didn't you go to the police? Like, like, I mean, it's one thing for someone who has been like hurt to like, be like, I don't know if I want to go to the police. Cause then I have to give them the whole story and all of that. But like you're a guy and you almost got hit by a motorcycle. It feels weird to me that you'd be like, I'm just not going to take this guy, you know, to the police. But all right. It's like, I always hear those things and I go like, did someone like, is that what you just thought at the time? And you just kind of ran with it. I want you to think through that a little bit. Uh, but all right, whatever. But like, he's trying to build a narrative that he has always cared about women. And I want you to see why he would do that. Because what he has been accused of for years is that he doesn't care about women, at least not in that way, or he doesn't view them as equal uh, that he constantly, I think uh, Mike Cosper, when he described the sermon of how dare you, he was saying that he treated uh, women like a prop in the sermon. And I think that's pretty accurate. Like if you listen to Mark Driscoll's sermons, it's always about the man and what they should do. And then the woman is just like, hey, you get to, you know, just follow him. Just follow him. You don't have to make these decisions for yourself. But it's just, I don't know. It's like some of that that stuff about like, Oh, I grew up in this hard place. Federal way ain't that hard. Um, but you know, whatever, every, every place has like a hard place to be. Maybe it was Renton. I don't know. I'm just saying like, it's, I don't think it was Tacoma and that would be like the one city where I'd be like, okay, all right. <laughs> but, uh, I love when I get to talk about Washington state. <laughs> <laughs> All right, but um, let's let's keep on going. But he's trying to build this narrative of that I've always cared about women. Just wrecked me, and I had two sisters as well. So then to hear that this kind of violence had happened to my wife, it just broke me and triggered me, and we got Grace some uh, help. And I started uh, at that time researching trauma and abuse and assault and a lot of what uh, we know today is, is really new information on these issues. Um, and, and this was a while ago, so there wasn't as much written. I read as much as I could. Yes, there was. There just wasn't popular in evangelicalism. Um, but there, there have been plenty of resources on abuse of all forms for years. Now, maybe not as much, and it's, like I said, especially in the evangelical world, you don't have, you know, TGC writing a bunch of stuff. Josh Butler wasn't writing things at that point. <laughs> uh, sorry, I had to throw that one in there. Uh, maybe that's why those TGC guys don't like me no more. On sexual assault and trauma and met with counselors and was trying to figure out a way to help my, uh, my best friend just kind of recover from what she had been through. And um, yeah, and so we were processing a lot of that uh, as a married couple and issues like disassociation and trauma triggers and trying to learn all of that to help Grace. And then at the time I was pastoring a church that was urban, uh, very young, and uh, it was uh, it started off as a college ministry. And so everybody was very young 
And uh, a lot of homeless kids, a lot of punk rockers, a lot of uh, drug use and abuse. And a lot of the men had deep-seated uh, porn habits and sexual addiction, and they were not safe men. And, um, and a lot of the women were sexual assault victims and trauma victims and abused. And, um, and a lot of it was uh, sometimes college campus drinking and rape culture. And so uh, baptized a lot of young Christians. I think we baptized all together like 10,000 in downtown. Got to throw that number in there. Town chop zone of Seattle. Um, and I was, I was out preaching in bars, fraternity parties. And I was uh, literally going to houses where homeless kids were encamped and sharing the gospel with them and climbing through, you know, kick down doors and broken windows. I just wanted to see people meet Jesus. Uh, said any pastor ever. <laughs> Like you go, like if you're a pastor in the chat, let me know how many times have, or not how many times I'll just say, have you sat down in a homeless person's makeshift shelter and tried to figure out a solution for them to get off the streets? I know I have, like, I know plenty of people who have like it's that's ministry. So like, I want you to see what he's doing. Like he's building this narrative of, I've always cared about women because I had sisters I have five sisters. Does that mean I cared about women two and a half times more? No. <laughs> like it's, that's not, okay. We all know, uh, we all have a mom. Okay. Um, but like you care about women and then my ministry was hard and uh, it's harder than other people's because what we were dealing with. Now I will say there's probably more, right? Like just because of, um, you know, percentages and you have more people. So you have more of that going on. But I would say that's probably not any different than any other local church of dealing with women who have been abused, um, of dealing with men who have done things that they regret, of dealing with uh, homeless people and drugs and all of that, uh, which I will also say uh, his new church probably isn't all that different either. It's just they're not punks, they're cowboys, because that's the vibe that he's trying to give off lately is that he's a cowboy which is still so ridiculous. But. And uh, and as Grace started talking more publicly about her assault and her trauma, it just created, uh, and it was very, very brave of her, uh, it created a wave. Got to get that talking point in there. Of women who um, felt that it was safe to talk about it. And so they started reporting to me as their pastor and us as their church their trauma, their abuse, uh, all that they had been through. And at this point, we were just a few years into um, Grace's healing and recovery process. And at that time as well, um, I had two daughters and uh, love my daughters with all my heart. Um, and the thought of men doing these things to not just daughters, but the God the Father's daughters, um, it just made me uh, just furious. Um, and so um, the week that I uh, was in the men in marriage. I that is such a like weird. I know exactly where I was when I was watching this <laughs> like moment. I think that sermon might have been the sixth or seventh take of the day. Um, I would preach um, and then I would go down on the floor to be available to pray. I want very clear. That was the sixth or seventh one of the day. All right. So he is saying that this was a one-time experience on the sixth or seventh time that he preached. For people to talk to them. And um, I guess I'm 53 now. So this would have been in my thirties. I've been a senior pastor since I was in my twenties. And then I would go up and preach again. And then I go down on the floor to answer questions and pray for people. And that was probably the sixth or seventh sermon of the day. I just I preached myself um, literally almost to death on a few. And he's bragged about that. I don't know how many times. And it's never in the context of like, you guys shouldn't do this. It's just like, always like, I preach so hard. I'm such a hard preacher. Okay. Occasions. And I spent the whole day with young women coming up to me and telling me how they were raped and assaulted and abused. And uh, some of it was by boyfriends and husbands and fathers, and some were even by pastors. 
And by the end of the day, I was completely emotionally devastated and angry and furious at all the damage done to women, starting with my wife. So, <laughs> again, I'm not saying like his emotions and his connection to his wife. I'm not saying that's false in any way. I just want to be really clear about that. Like, I'm not teasing someone for crying. I'm not doing any of that. Uh, if something like that happened to my wife, you can bet I would be super emotional. So I'm not, uh, we're not talking about that. What triggered that was uh, a girl came up to me. Uh, it was an African-American girl. She had just turned 18. This was before the last service of the day. And uh, she said, uh, she said, Pastor Mark, um, can I talk to you about my dad? And I said, yeah, honey, you can do that. And uh, again, and again, some hard words are going to be said. So kids, headphones, things like that. I said, uh, she said, I, I never knew my dad. My dad raped my mom. And she said, so I was born out of rape. And my mom told me I was never allowed to meet my dad because uh, he wasn't a safe man. And she said, when I turned 18, I, I found out who my biological father was. And I scheduled a meeting with him. And this was a gal I knew. I was her pastor. She was in our church. I think she was a college freshman. And um, I said, oh, so you got to meet your dad? And she said, yeah, I did. I flew out and I met my dad. And uh, I said, what happened? And she said, he raped me. I honestly started crying so hard, I threw up and then preached the sermon. Um, and so ever since then, um, uh, yeah, some of my critics and those who say I'm a misogynist and hate women, they're like, look at how angry this guy is. I'm like, why isn't every sane man filled with the Spirit this angry? And uh, if this is happening uh, to God's daughters, how come nobody's pissed? So that was his closer. That was his line. Now, again, the, the narrative that he is trying to put forward is that he just cares about women and values women so much to and has seen so much of them being taken advantage of, abused, all kinds of sexual stuff happening to them. Like, And so he had to do something, and he was just so angry, especially in connection to what was happening with his wife and all of that. And so it all kind of built up into this one pivotal moment. And that's why he did what he did and went up there and said, how dare you and lost control and, and was just raking his guys over the coals for this. And, um, you know, that's, that, is that true? Is that true? Well, not according to the rise and fall of Mars Hill. All right. Um, I have a video that I have to, all right, here we go. All right. I want to bring this one in. All right, here we go. Let's, let's bring this in. All right. So this is the rise and fall of Mars Hill. This was the episode that I listened to and I was like, I need to talk about this. So listen to this. I do think you have to interrogate why this is happening and why it happened the way it happened. At the time the video went viral, back in 2009, I knew Mars Hill had a bunch of services, and I wondered if this happened to just one of them. After all, he tells the audience that any emotions they feel aren't because he's screaming at them. It's the Holy Spirit, he says. In an interview a few years later with Dennis Rainey, Mark described the day like this. Yeah, I was preaching that sermon, and uh, my notes are usually very minimal. I make up most of the cross-references and illustrations. They just sort of happen in the moment. I'm more of an extemporaneous preacher, and so I just kind of got fired up. A little later, he compared it to how he does counseling sessions with men. So, uh, yeah, I just started thinking about those guys, and all of a sudden, what was the sermon just sort of shifted into a counseling session uh, that everybody got to watch, because usually that's how I go at those guys when the doors are closed. Well... It turns out there were five services that Sunday, and I was able to confirm that Mark screamed just like this at all five. Someone who was intimately familiar with all of these operations confirmed that the whole thing was planned and rehearsed. It was made by Mark for TV, and I'm yet to meet someone for whom it was a pivot point in their life. They're probably out there, don't get me wrong. I just haven't heard from them myself. Well, someone is lying. <laughs> like, that's... When you have two narratives, 
that have been put out there that contradict each other, one of them is lying. So who is it? Is it Christianity Today and Mike Cosper and the people that he talked to, which again, thousands of witnesses because there are so many campuses, uh, or is it Mark Driscoll? Because Mark Driscoll is saying that this was just built up into this one pivotal moment, that it was like the sixth or seventh sermon of the day, and he had just been, like, he has, like, his wife's history, and then, like, seeing all this stuff and having to deal with this so often, and then this one moment where this one woman comes up and tells this horrible, awful story to where Mark goes and he says he throws up and then comes and preaches this sermon, and that's why he lost control is because he just thought about that moment and it was like this like volcano erupting. Um, that is not accurate according to all these witnesses. All these witnesses are saying that he did this at every single service, that he screamed in the exact same way, that he used the exact same words, that he went up there with this this uh, this narrative of wanting to get up there and get in people's faces, and he just wanted to yell at them. And then also, uh, it's these videos back in the day, there was no one clipping these things out. All right. There was no one who was like me, you know, like listening to sermons or something like, oh, wow, I'm going to clip this out and going to share it. You know, there's like, I'm going to put it on Twitter. I'm going to I'm going to share it there. Like we this was in the time period when like we had just stopped waiting 45 minutes to download a Homestar Runner video, okay? A 4-minute flash video. <laughs> like no one no one clipped this out except for Marcel. Except for Mark. Mark wanted this video to get out there because he was marketing to young angry men. And he still is. So what is he doing? He is using the trauma of his wife. He's using the trauma uh, of people under his ministry who have gone, many have said on a podcast that he did not help the trauma. All right. He is using that trauma for his own means of still marketing to these men. Because as uh, Cosper said in this episode somewhere, uh, that it was he just used women as a as a as uh, just like basically a plot point to get to where he wanted. Like he's doing the same thing here because he wants to get this video out there and he knows that there's a controversy around it and he knows that his enemies will use it and be like, look, this guy is like putting this video out again where he's just angry, where he's manipulative, where he's getting up there and just screaming. And uh, some would say he's using profanity as he does it. Other people would just say harsh language. Uh, but he's getting up there and he's he's losing his temper. And the guy is known for losing his temper to the point where he was kicked out of his church, or at least was asked to go through church discipline because of his temper. And he ran away. And he knows like that that's going to be the narrative that people will talk about with this video. But he wants it to get out to these angry young men that he's marketing to, these little cowboys who look to him and say like, oh, he's doing something. The the Ogden, Utah boys, you know, like that that kind of stuff. The patriarchy boys, he's, he's trying to market to them. He's trying to get in with them as these protectors, as these strong men. We need real men. His whole ministry right now is real faith, real men, real all this stuff. His narrative that he gave is not real. The reasonings why he says he felt this way are not real. This is not something small to where you could you'd be like, well, from someone else's perspective, from someone else's perspective, you could see how it would be a little bit different. It's either all these witnesses are wrong or Mark is lying. Like these, those are really the only two options. And if he's willing to lie about something that is so easily found out, to be like, well, he did this the exact same way over and over that entire day. Like, there's something wrong with that. Someone who would be so brazen to be like, I could I could get away with this. And you know what? He might, because no one else really cares. And this is the guy that is growing his platform. And all these young men who are angry and upset at the world are listening to 
and they're just going to be swindled once again. Uh, because, you know, wouldn't anyone be so angry to see all this stuff? There's a way to use anger. There is such a thing as righteous anger. Getting up on, on a stage and screaming, you know, I'll, I'll say it. Some people will clip this out. <laughs> what the hell is wrong with you? Like, like that kind of language, you're going to get up there and you're going to use that kind of language. Like that, there's something wrong with that preacher. There is something wrong with that preacher. Now, you might be like, oh, I think you're reading too much into this thing. I'm just saying there is a blatant lie that is here in this intro. Like, I know that this video isn't going to get him the success that he wants. Because right now, it has less views than when he puts a red heifer on a thumbnail. Uh, so I don't think it's going to be the thing that he thought it was going to be, this battle cry that they could, you know, he could use his greatest weakness against, you know, his critics and turn his weakness into his strength. I don't think that that's going to happen with this thing. But it's just another example of people being willing to just be like, whatever you say. To, to a megachurch pastor, to someone with a platform, whatever you say, fine, we'll listen to you. And they shouldn't be listened to. If you're willing to lie about something this public and this small and just dumb, like you could have made the same argument. You could have made the exact same argument and say, like, look, this happened to my wife and I got really mad and I kind of lost control a little bit. And I think a lot of people would be like, that's understandable. But to go into detail and use like this buildup of like in saying like, oh, this wasn't planned, but I have like this whole three part sermon to this thing. Like we know what you're doing. You're building up this narrative so you can say, stop getting mad at me and my critics, my critics and my enemies. They're the real bad guys because I'm standing up for women. But you're not letting them have any like strengthen their stories. You're not allowing them to share their stories. Like you're, I don't like, I'm assuming his wife gave him permission to talk about that publicly, but it's just, you're using women's stories to move your video along so that you can get it out there. I, I just think it's so wicked <laughs> and it's such a small thing that you didn't have to do at all. And it just shows like how brazen this guy is that he could just say and, you know, do what he wants and go unquestioned by his followers. And I think that's like a horrible thing because those followers are growing now. Should I do it? Uh, I, I think I will. I'm going to take a second and go on a little bit of a break because I want to show a video that Mark Driscoll isn't the only one who does this kind of stuff. I want to show you a video that's going around about John MacArthur. Um, and uh, we'll be right back. Thanks for hanging with me. This is kind of, this is off the cuff. I was not prepared to do this, but you know what? We're going to have a very, 
like just off the cuff Fundyville, I guess. I'll, I'll say this is a Fundyville segment. And bring it on down to Fundy. All right. Now, let me know if you have seen this video going around. Uh, but, you know, like there there is this whole narrative that that John MacArthur saw Mark Driscoll's fall coming because of his language. And uh, I just want to talk about that because these these celebrity pastors, these, uh, you know, these these, uh, I don't know, social media rock stars, and evangelicalism, they they put out these narratives and they just like assume that it's true. And then every once in a while, there's something that gets put out and you're like, that kind of contradicts that. Uh, there are 104 people who are watching right now in 31 or 39 likes. Uh, do me a favor if you're new or maybe you're just like not, you're not like a YouTuber kind of guy. You, you don't, you don't watch or lady, uh, you don't watch YouTube that much. Hit the like button on this video while you're watching. It does make a difference for, for my analytics and the growth of the show. And I would just really appreciate it. I really want to get to a hundred likes. Um, so let's, let's watch this. This was put out by Kuiper belt productions. Um, and I don't know why, but it's it's out there. So let's let's listen uh, a little bit of language at the end. Spoilers. Sins of Scripture. I have to confess, it's still common, and I am somewhat frightened by it. The other day on the charismatic television, That's there was John a McCarthy's person voice. being interviewed, and they said uh, he said he was born in 1929. And he said God had him to be born in 1929 because his life verse is Matthew 19:29. Oh, they went into euphoria over that. Oh, how wonderful. And what is Matthew 19, 29? With men it is impossible, but with God all things are possible. Oh, what a life verse. That's your life verse, because you were born in 1929. And then the host said, oh, I was born in 1934. What's Matthew 1934? That'll be my life verse. And so and he sounded his wife just looked like up that. Matthew 1934, and of course Matthew 19 doesn't have 34 verses. <laughs> And so Mark doesn't have 19 chapters, so you're left with Luke. And he said, look up Luke 1934, look up Luke 1934, that'll be it. And she looked it up, and with great excitement she said, and Jesus said, I have need of him, I have need of him. And he said, that's it, he has need of me, he has need of me. And she kept looking, and this, she looked up and said, no, 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 it's talking about a jackass. <laughs> And I said, right. <laughs> what? <laughs> it is. So, um, you know, <laughs> there's some times where it's just like, wait, I thought your morals were like this way. Like you, you say, oh, we shouldn't be using that kind of language. Driscoll. Now in Driscoll dropped like the occasional, like, I think it was even like an F-bomb. Like every once in a while, he was known as like the cussing pastor back in the day, which is probably why that drew in all these young, angry punk rockers, right? In Seattle, like that makes sense. Um, but, you know, MacArthur was like, no, you can't use that kind of language unless you're making fun of charismatics. Right? Like you see the hypocrisy with some of this stuff. Like how you push out narratives of like, oh, I'm going to stand for holiness and decorum, even in the pulpit. And then, but you get to use, you know, this word in the pulpit to get a laugh from your audience. Like you're not even like really articulating scripture. Like you're, you're just getting a laugh because of the punchline is a cuss word. Like, oh, but it's also, it also means donkey. Like, come on, you got up there and you knew exactly what you were doing. And he goes like, right, right. I don't know what's up with the fingers always being pointed up. I guess like everyone's a Daniel Bryan fan just doing like the yes chant. Uh, but it's just, I see this so often with these celebrity pastors. They'll, they'll get up and they'll build a platform or they'll further their platform with this narrative of they're for this or they're for that. And then they show themselves to be hypocritical. Aaron, uh, Aaron Armstrong, who has written a really good book, which I should make a video about. I read it, Aaron. It's great. Um, now what? Uh, but he says this, uh, there's an irony with Driscoll. For years, he's played up the real man shtick. 
casting himself as the hero in that narrative, but constantly portrays himself as a victim, right? Like he has gone at culture for this victim mentality and how, you know, you just need to conquer in Christ, you know, like that, that's the narrative that's being pushed by some of these like far right types. And yet here he is in a video portraying himself as a victim of other people's, you know, narrative about them because it works for him in the moment. And John MacArthur, it worked for him in the moment to use a cuss word from the pulpit because he's talking about, you know, some charismatic teacher, probably Kenneth Copeland. Uh, but it's just these, you got to be careful with these celebrity pastors and anyone, you know, whether it's your, your pastor, some pastor, you're just visiting a church. Like, don't just assume that they're like, when they say I'm for this, that they're actually for that. Listen to the, their words, go back, listen to old stuff. Keep listening to these people. And just come on, come on. Johnny Appleseed says, ah, yes, my favorite comedian. <laughs> come on. Don't, don't be like that. All right. Uh, let's, let's go to the penalty box and let's deal with some real comedians. You want to see a penalty? I'll show you a real penalty. Get out of my face, man. 109 people watching 52 likes. I'm just saying, click one of the buttons. Click one of them. Either the like or the dislike. Just click one of them. Either way, it, it helps the channel. <laughs> so do, do me a favor. All right. Uh, let's let's see. What do we got? We What do we got going into the penalty box? Two minute minor trip. We got a minor. We got a minor. Um, okay, okay, Sills. He's okay, Sills. Uh, 46 minutes of sophomoric nonsense to get to the advertised Piper comment. What pastor would take their family to DL for, I had, I had read it to my wife three times before I understood what DL meant. <laughs> I was like, what is this? Uh, Disneyland. Because I referenced so many of these, uh, pastors who want to go to shepherd's conference. They convince their families like we're going on vacation. It'll be a vacation because it's so expensive to go. And if they go, the family isn't getting a family vacation that year or two years or three years, depending. Um, but it's really expensive to go there. And so I was like, Oh, they'll, they'll go to Disneyland for a day after, you know, this four day, uh, period of going to sermons and doing the shepherd's conference thing. And apparently, uh, what pastor would take their family to Disneyland? Yeah, someone took me up on the offer of hitting the dislike button. <laughs> you have missed so much about biblical instruction regarding music, worship about masculinity but he doesn't tell me what it is if you're gonna come in here and you're gonna be like you've missed all this and it's just like well what is it <laughs> could you help me out with that i would like to know what i've missed very worldly channel <laughs> very worldly i mean have you seen the background uh, there's jaws I'm like that's steven spielberg that's that's he's so all right, uh, let's move on. <laughs> Thanks for that. Okay, Sills. Um, two minutes for oh. slashing and two minutes for roughing. Talking, talking about the Drisky. Some Drisky business going on. Mark Driscoll has not changed. I don't need like it's every week. There's some weird comment or several. Uh, Con the Christian. Eric, is that you? Uh, we are done. We are done done apologizing and trying to fit this weird criteria standard Ooh, hold christians to it's cringe y'all can say whatever would would have you want but if we respond like a regular human would you make a whole video corny um here's the deal if i'm not making a video well i guess i put you in a video oh i stand corrected <laughs> i did <laughs> Welcome to the penalty box con. Uh, and then uh, new new Island restore 7305. Bro, you sound like such a little baby. No, little baby. Uh, men today are so soft. Christian men really need to stop being so sensitive about everything. And you had to leave a comment to express it. <laughs> All right, you could you you could disagree with me. It's totally fine, but don't be like, "Oh, you're so sensitive, and you're so sensitive that I'm so sensitive." Or it's just like this, like vicious cycle of sensitivity. Is that what we're doing right now? <laughs> like, all right, welcome to the penalty box, guys. Next up, 
There's the whistle. There's no excuse there. He knows that whistle's been blown. No excuse, how dare you? Uh, why I don't watch The Chosen, <laughs> which again is a video where I just got asked by Wendy, you know, what do you think about The Chosen? And I clipped out a little segment of where I say why I don't watch it. And I never say you can't watch it or it's bad. It's the worst. It's, you know, no one, no Christian should watch it. Just that I don't watch it. You want to talk about sensitivity. Uh, so Sam, Sam, Sam Ningith, Sam Ningith, uh, says, so you haven't watched it and you're having an opinion. Your channel sucks. <laughs> Here's the deal. I don't know how many times I got to say this. Just because I've never tried cocaine doesn't mean I know it's bad. You know, like, like, I don't have to try drugs in order to know that it's just not something I would enjoy. <laughs> I just, I don't think I would like it. And so that's why I don't watch it. And I do have some reasons of things that I have thought through that you should also think through. But you got to think through that for yourself. Uh, just because I say I'm not a fan, I... I don't have to try something in order for me to know that I'm not going to be a fan of that thing. All right. If that was the case, let's all go to the oven, put our hand on it. <laughs> like let's, let's start doing all the dangerous things that our mommies told us not to when we were little, <laughs> because we don't know. We don't know. Maybe we'll be fans of it. <laughs> like, come on. Stop messing with me about the chosen. Okay. <laughs> Leave me alone. Welcome to the penalty box. <sighs> oh, guys, we have a new segment. I forgot about this. Uh, we've 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 uh, oh, we've gone a long time, but you know what? If people keep hitting the like button, I might continue with the show. And I've got a new segment that we have not seen before, never seen before on live television YouTube. Uh, I've got I've got something. I'm not saying it's great, but it is something you guys haven't seen. <laughs> Did I sell that properly? I don't know. I'm not a mega church pastor. I don't know how to sell things. Um, let's go here. Mm-hmm, 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 mm-hmm. I don't know why it wasn't pulled up, but we're going to pull it up now. All right. Um, oh, that's true. Is this about is is this about the cocaine or is this about the chosen? <laughs> Oh my goodness. Aaron, what's wrong with these people? Okay. Uh, <laughs> Heidi. Oh, Dean just compared the chosen to drugs. Don't touch my big bang theory, Dean. It's not like drugs. <laughs> oh, that's funny. That's really funny. All right. Let's uh let's see. Uh we only got three more likes on that. Dang! Is that how many haters I got? I got that many haters? Got a lot of haters. I knew I did, but like, why are you guys watching live? Like, don't you got better stuff to do? <laughs> Hit the like button, peoples. All right. Uh, I'm going to show it to you anyways because it's already pulled up and I already worked on the graphic, so I might as well show it. Here we go. Congratulations. You played yourself. Welcome to the new segment. Congratulations. You played yourself. Uh, DJ Kelly. Another one. Here we go. Uh, this is this is Stephen Furtick. Uh, Stephen Furtick-ing himself. So I'm going to play a little clip of a song mm -hmm. and you're going to pretend like that song title is your sermon title for this series, Do the New You. And I want you to tell people how you would preach that title. Okay? Oh. Got it? Yeah. All right. Roll the first song. First song. <laughs> That was I see Alvin. the Israelites standing on the shore of the Red Sea. I see Moses telling the Israelites, why are you crying? God's about to deliver us. Stand still and see the sun. I'm sorry. I can't. You listen to a song, bro, and you're just like, I've got a sermon ready to go. Uh, definitely using your that scripture properly, having studied well. And you're just like, I see the Israelites. And then, man, imagine having that kind of, like, no wonder this guy is prideful. Uh, and that's evidence. All right. Like, it's, I'm not, it's very clear this guy is prideful. Okay. Uh, but, like, I'm, oh, how could you not when you have thousands of people, when you say, I see the Israelites, and they're like, yeah. I'm like, what? 
man, I want that kind of an audience when like I go anywhere, like which milk do I get? And I get the right milk and they're just like, yeah, salvation of the Lord. And I hear God saying back to Moses mm-hmm. in Exodus 14, why are you crying out to me? Tell the Israelites to move on. And since the song is called Stuck in a Moment, I hear God saying to Moses and to you, you're not stuck because that stick in your hand, if you stretch it over the Red Sea that you're so afraid of Mm -hmm. and get your eyes off of the water and begin to walk in faith. That's it. I promise you, I did not give him a heads up about this, okay? <clears throat> Are you ready for the next one? The last time a game like this was played on this stage, Bishop T.D. Jakes was doing the answering. This is really, really wrong of you to do this no, to me. Uh, no, it's not. No, okay, it's not. All okay. right, here we go. You ready okay. for the next He's one? He's slightly upset. Yeah. I believe it. There was a king who made a treaty with an enemy king in the Old Testament, and after he made the treaty, the enemy said, well, I actually want your children, too. He said, all right, and then he said, actually, I want all your livestock, too, and at some point, the king had to say, that's it. I'm drawing a line. The deal's off. I know I said you could have my children, and I know I said you could have our treasury, and I know I said you could have the land. But I met with God, and I realized that if I give you an inch, you'll take a mile. And if I give you a corner of my life, you'll want to take the whole room. Come on. And if I give you my thoughts, you'll want to take my behaviors. And if I give you my behaviors, you're going to want to take my patterns. Come on. And if you take my patterns, you can have my life. So I see somebody like that Old Testament king going back to the enemy and saying, the deal's off. The deal is off. I changed my mind. I changed my mind. I remember what King David said to a giant, the Philistine that stood the nine Philistine. feet tall. And all of the other Israelites said he's too <laughs> Why does he say Philistine? Philistine. All right. Big to fight, but David said he's too big to miss. That's right. Who is this uncircumcised Philistine? Send him a message. Tell him, I won't. Somebody shout, I won't. I won't. Back down. Back, back down. down. High five three people say, don't back down. High now. five. <laughs> you come too far to back down now. Yeah, yeah. I hear Tom Petty say, don't do it. <laughs> Petty. Tom Petty's the Holy Spirit now, guys. I'm here no more. <laughs> Oh, this is a church service. <laughs> Guys, you played yourself, all right? Like, everyone talks about you that you go up and you just wing sermons, and you, then you get up here and to prove them all wrong, you wing sermons based off of music lyrics, which they're not even picking good songs. Okay, I'm moving on. This, you played yourself. All right, that's the show today, guys. I got little man. He woke up early from a nap, and he's having a juice. Right over there. I was so subtle, though. You probably didn't notice. (laughs) Someday I'm going to make an outro. Okay. Thanks for hanging out with me, guys. 99 people watching. 67 likes. Two dislikes. I'll remember this. All right. You hear me? Those people? You just just didn't want to hit the like button. I'm going to remember this. And guess what? I won't back down.